Good evening, everyone. I just want to actually do a quick introduction of Dr. Aluwalia, not very long for those of you who have come from far. Uh, Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia is one of the leading global economists, and he's a former civil servant who served as the Commerce Secretary and later as the Finance Secretary. He carried out some of the most important economic reforms under Dr. Manmohan Singh. He was a key member of the team that implemented the 1991 reforms, which dismantled government controls that effectively opened India to the world, and we are reaping the benefits of that today. So I want to start, and most recently, of course, he served as the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, but I want to start by asking you about everybody's taking stock of the last 25 years, and as I said, that we are reaping the benefits of that, but do you think that we have come as far as you would have liked India too, and also reflect a little bit on that point in time when it all started, and where are we today? Well, thank you, Preeti. Um, first of all, I should say that uh, about a couple of days ago, I did an interview for Mint. So uh, if there's anyone interested, why don't you circulate that interview to them? And whatever I say now, if it looks contradictory, <laughs> it, it could be that I've changed my mind, or it could be that you haven't <laughs> fully understood what I said. But uh, send me an email uh, indicating how come you said this when that's what you said in the interview. I'll definitely do that. Okay, it's my so job yeah. as a journalist to do now, that. Now, <laughs> uh, a quick answer. There's no question that we wouldn't have got anywhere near where we are if those reforms hadn't happened. And certainly it was a privilege uh, to be part of that process. It wasn't, uh, I mean, you know, I don't think reforms in India s sort of suddenly arrived in 1991. Uh, during the 1980s, there was a lot of thinking going on. Uh, I was then uh, in the office of uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi in the second half of the 1980s. And you know, we were, many things, he started many things that we were discussing even more. But I would say that many of the ideas that later on surfaced uh, in the 91 reforms, you know, had begun to evolve. And certainly we had thought that, you know, if he came back, I mean, we'd be able to implement them and so on. Of course, I mean, all credit to the government in 91, Mr. Narasimha Rao as Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh as Finance Minister, uh, they came in in the middle of a huge crisis. And that always helps because, you know, when there's a big crisis, yeah. I mean, you can more or less tell people, listen, if you think you can do a better job, come along and do it, but otherwise, trust me. Uh, that's what Mr. Rao and Dr. Singh more or less said. And I think it enabled quite a lot of things to happen. But, you know, what actually happened is not just what was done then because, you know, the crisis was over by 1993. Uh, so those who think, oh, you just did that because the IMF forced you, I mean, that's complete rubbish. I mean, we would have just gone back once the crisis was over to the bad old days. And the reforms were by no means complete by 1993. The fact that we continued is a reflection of the fact that in India, people had worked out that this way of doing things which we were following just didn't make any sense. Now, mind you, in my view, we should have done it 10 years earlier. Uh, but for whatever reason, these things in a democracy take longer. So I have no doubt that we wouldn't be anywhere near where we are if those reforms hadn't happened and then been continued. In my view, I mean, what we did in 20 years plus after 1991 should have been done in 10. Right. I mean, I'm not a great believer in the what you call the Big Bang reform theory, which you just go in and sort of turn everything upside down. You know, maybe uh, that sort of thing was recommended by people like, at one stage, even Jeff Sachs, uh, in the context of the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, when you're just having a total institutional change, okay? But you know, when you're in a functioning system where lots of people like whatever's going on, you have to do these things a bit gradually. But in my view, gradually doesn't mean 25 years. It should have been 12. That's my biggest uh, complaint. Second, uh, do we stop? Not at all. Because I think we're just beginning to see uh, what are the, I don't like the phrase second generation reforms, by the way. Mm. Uh, it, it's, I would more, I'd say the, these are second and third stage right. 
stages of the society. Yeah. You know, many first generation reforms are yet to be completed. So it's not as if, it's simply not the case that we've done all the first generation reforms and now we're working on the second generation reform. There are a lot of first generation reforms, but they're not maybe that important. I mean, the big ones have got done. So there's a huge task ahead, which we still have to do. So are there any learnings from that period that you think can be implemented today? Are you sympathetic, first of all, to, there is so much impatience in the global economy to see India become this leading emerging power and people want to invest money here and yet are skeptical to do it. <laughs> So does it seem like more of the same from 25 years back? You know, uh, the truth is uh, the logic of being an open economy is that you welcome uh, any integration with the world, both in terms of trade and certainly in terms of foreign investment. I mean, one good thing is that virtually all political parties now welcome foreign investment. I mean, there was a time when, uh, when the Congress introduced it uh, people said, oh, but the left is not in favor. But then they got, uh, they were replaced by a united front government, which actually had the Communist Party as part of the government. But they sort of went along with the same thing. And then, of course, people felt that the BJP was not very pro-foreign investment. But when the Vajpayee government came, they didn't turn back anything. And now you have a new, another NDA government, and they're giving very strong you know, foreign investment is welcome. So I'm assuming that the world uh, learns from this that foreign investment is welcome. They shouldn't, there's no chance, in my view, of any Indian government turning the clock back. That's very different, by the way, from uh, creating an environment which makes the foreign investor uh, happy. I think there, we, you must recognize that, you know, in India, I don't think we can have differential treatment of foreign investors compared with domestic investors. So the name of the game is how to make the place more investor friendly. Yeah. That's an overwhelmingly important thing. And I mean, in the previous government, we used to emphasize that quite a bit. The present government is also talking about ease of doing business. And those are very major things that need to be addressed. So you're obviously in touch with the, the global economic elite and uh, perhaps even heads of state. What is your perspective of specifically countries like China and United States, how are they viewing India at this point in time? You know, I, I personally feel that we should avoid the hype uh, that the whole world is waiting for India and all. I mean, I think generally, uh, whenever the world talks about any country, whichever that country is, uh, they always say, oh, that's a very important part of the world and that's a good thing to think of. We're not big enough in my view Really? Uh, to, I don't think so. I mean, in terms of, uh, look, uh, India, India's GDP is one-fourth of China, okay? Now, I find it is very nice to be the fastest growing country amongst the emerging markets, but let's face it, at 7.5%, uh, and China is four times India's size, so China is now growing at 6.3%. But, you know, at 6.3%, if it's four times India's size, is contributing a lot more to global GDP than India is. There's no doubt that people looking ahead, I mean, China they take for granted is going to be a major economic power. I think they're beginning to realize that if India gets its act together, that's a big question mark, yeah. but if it gets its act together, it will be, it's not going to overtake China in absolute terms for quite some time, but it will certainly be the next country after China as far as uh, emerging markets are concerned. And you know, if you're a foreigner and you want to invest, I mean, to my mind, it would make a lot of sense to invest in both India and China rather than just go to one or the other, yeah. you know? Um, but <clears throat> what you just said, what does it mean actually that uh, it, we should become investor friendly? The budget is just coming up and the RBI governor has said that we should move towards fiscal consolidation. There are people who say that we should do more public expenditure uh, you know, and have private investment come in. So there seems to be a little bit of this conversation happening. From your point of view, what do you think is optimal? Well, I don't want I, you know, since all the, the budget is actually, from what I know about the timetable, and I don't think it has changed since the time I was there, all the budget decisions are taken. They're just putting the finishing touches and getting the printing done. So there's no point in speculating 
whatever they're going to do, they've done. I think what R Governor Rajan has said is actually, all that he said is that, look, when you look at a country, you have to be able to say that the country is assuring macroeconomic balance. I think it's extremely difficult uh, to address a group of investors and to say, this is a great country. Of course, we've got a macroeconomic imbalance, but what does that matter? We're such nice people, why don't you come in and invest? So you have to be saying you have a macroeconomic balance. Now the question is, what is a macroeconomic balance? I mean, you know, uh, all he said is that, listen, you said you were going to consolidate the fiscal deficit. Just uh, keep, keep on track. I find that, you know, the debate, that, uh, the debate then goes into saying, uh, you said 3.5% of GDP. You know, suppose it turns out to be 3.6. Does it matter? Well, who knows? But my point is the difference between 3.5 and 3.6 is not going to give a huge... Uh, impulse either. Yeah. But, you know, any large departure, whoever's writing financial analysis reports is probably going to look at it quite negatively. Now, this wouldn't matter in my view, you know, if, uh, if growth was visibly booming, if uh, huge numbers of reforms had been done, uh, and we were saying, look, uh, this country is really on the go, and, you know, maybe for a year the fiscal deficit uh, is being exceeded. Perhaps a lot of financial analysts would say, uh, well, maybe, you know, there's something. But if that's not the case, and I mean, the global environment is extremely uncertain. I mean, India, according to the IMF, will grow at about 7.5% or so next year. Uh, and China will grow at 6.3. That's what people keep focusing on. India has overtaken China in growth rates. Um, but, you know, it's a highly uncertain world. Uh, there's serious questions about whether China's growth rate uh, is being properly reflected in the data. There are lots of questions about whether China may be overinvested in infrastructure and real estate. I mean, countries often do that. And, you know, while it, it has an advantage because you've got the infrastructure, I mean, if you've borrowed heavily for that infrastructure, then some bank is going to have a problem. So that reflects, uh, creates a difficulty. George Soros says that China is headed for a hard landing, okay? The Chinese press has ticked him off for that. Um, could that be, could that work to India's advantage in any way? or is No, that just I, let me say, if China is too big uh, uh, for anyone to think, that a, a disruption in China is going to work to our advantage. The contagion effect will be much more negative. So we should wish China well, and we should hope that it doesn't have a hard landing uh, and remains open and all the rest of it. Uh, so I don't, but let me say what does make a difference is that if China is consolidating, which it is, I mean, they themselves say so, uh, India is in a position. Remember, China is consolidating after 30 years of 10% growth. I mean, That's been they couldn't possibly have gone on doing that, and they know that too. But I think people are kind of willing to say, well, maybe, you know, India could have 20 years of, if not 10%, but certainly 8% growth. But nobody says that this is going to happen if India doesn't get its act together. And that's the real question. We're talking the right talk. Uh, people are wondering whether we're going to walk the right walk. Uh, but I think that most people that I've talked to, uh, I mean, so-called experts, would say that in real uh, resource capability terms, including human resources, management capability, uh, kinds of uh, companies that exist, the sort of entrepreneurial skills that exist, et cetera, if a lot of sensible things are done, 20 years of 8% growth is perfectly possible. But there are lots of things that have to be done for that. One of the, I think there, there's a lot of the investor community here, and uh, people have questioned about uh, the Sneeti Ayog and whether it serves the full function of what the Planning Commission did and adds value on top of it. I mean, you had seven, eight key functions uh, as the deputy chairman. And there is some speculation about what is happening to some of those significant roles that you played. Who is doing that job? 
I mean, you were. Well, I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what role I played, but let me put it this way: I, I personally do not regard organizational structures as very important. I forget it was an American uh, president, was it Madison or someone, who said, you know, on forms of government, let fools contend. Uh, what is best is what works best. So personally, I'm in favor every five years of abolishing all ministries and restructuring them into what you want. Mm -hmm. So I wish Niti Aayog well. I mean, it's got more or less the same staff that we had. Yeah. They're trying to do a good job. I have no idea what they're doing. And not, I mean, I'm not looking at that. I don't think that that change is a critical one. Uh, I think we, you know, Probably in my view, and this was my view when I was in the Planning Commission, I mean, uh, the former Prime Minister had asked me to prepare some proposals for how should the Planning Commission be restructured. And I had said, you know, the, probably the single most important thing, if you really want a good Planning Commission, it cannot be staffed by the regular civil service. Uh, you need to have a structure where on a particular thing, we should bring in the best expertise in India and maybe even the world. That's not the way it's staffed. It's staffed like any ministry. Right. So if somebody is interested in power, if he's lucky, he becomes a secretary power, and if he's number two, he's sent off as advisor power in the planning commission. And both of them have come from the Ministry of Agriculture somewhere else. I mean, that's not, in my view, yeah. the way to run a system. I'm talking about the way we were and we're constrained. I mean, you know, we, we, don't have, we don't have a mechanism where, I don't know whether Niti Aayog now has it, but I didn't have a mechanism where I could say uh, that, look, the best expert in India on this subject is X, and we have to pay him this salary, which is half of what he's earning or she's earning, uh, and it's much more than what the government would permit, not possible. And yet there was a time when this was happening. I mean, Dr. Manmohan Singh was brought in in that capacity. No, no, no. Let me say that that was only for economists. And let me say that stopped. You know, right. in the old days, the position of economic advisor was a position uh, to which uh, the Indian Economic Service was eligible to compete, but so were lateral entries. As a result, I mean, we invariably recruited people from outside. Dr. Manmohan Singh is one, Bimal Jalan is another, I'm a third, Vijay Khelka, I mean, many, uh, Arvind yeah. Virmani, Shankar Acharya, you name it. And that played a huge role. Well, naturally, we economy. think so. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think, I do think this is, an, what happened is interesting, because the Indian Economic Service said, look here, uh, the IAS grabs all the top jobs, and that's why it's an attractive service. If you make the top jobs of economists open, then why would we be an attractive service? People would go do other things and come back at a higher level. So the government thought about it and they stopped the outside recruitment. Today, only the chief economic advisor is laterally recruited. All the other economic advisors are taken basically from the career system. And as a result, we have Arvind Subramanian, the first rate guy. Um, but yeah. we, could not, uh, we could not recruit the similarly from laterally. Uh, nothing to do with people willing to come. I mean, the jobs are not open. And that's only economists. When I say technocrats, I mean, after all, if you take over the world of IT, or you talk about telecom, or you talk about logistics, I mean, these are the things that we need to work on, right? I mean, the country is now full of expertise. In 1990, when the reforms began, I think I've said this somewhere, you know, 80% of the knowledge on anything was inside the government, simply because the public sector dominated everything, right? Uh, today, only 20% is inside and 80% is outside. But we're running governmental system where we can't draw these people in, which is just absurd. But didn't you have this conversation in the decade that you were there and you had... Absolutely. You know, I've minister. written notes to the former prime minister saying this is what we need to do. But, you know, I was... So what it, does it take to do it? Why doesn't it get done? Well, it's very interesting what you say because, you know, the rules are such that uh, the first stage of reforms consists of the system saying, yes, that's a good idea, we must do it, but then they do it in a way which is self-destructive. So I fought very hard to get consultants. I said, look, I must have 
the right to get 60 consultants. In the primary planning commission for the whole of India, nothing much, right? So the department, they said, yes, you must have the right to get. And, you know, it had a, a, a salary, I think, but the maximum salary they were willing to pay was 60,000 or some such thing, okay? Now, there's a rule somewhere, it was, that, you know, consultants cannot be paid more than uh, the difference between a secretary's pension and a secretary's full salary. And the reason was that, that otherwise secretaries would all become consultants, right? So this was a way that if you want to work, you just keep getting your, the same salary, okay? And that looked like quite sensible. You're, we're talking about a world now in which 25-year-olds are making three times the secretary's salary. It is to the credit of the system that many young people were still willing to come and work. <clears throat> but you know, a 40-year-old or a 35-year-old <clears throat> with a wife and two kids, it's very difficult to attract them because when you look at the rules, consultants are not allowed a house, consultants are not given a car, consultants are not given telephones, and these are the perks that make government salaries a little bit more palatable. So, so were you able I, to I, didn't realize, I mean, I didn't realize this until after we got it done, and I was told, oh, yes, you certainly can hire a consultant, but you can't get a house, and you can't get this, and you can't get that. Well, you know, it's not that it can't be overridden. I mean, but what I mean is it takes a long time, and you've got to ruthlessly change whatever is necessary. Uh, and you run into problems even there. The problems really are that people think that you're recruiting your own buddies into very attractive jobs. Because in your uh, term, I remember there was great excitement in Harvard and other campuses to come and work at the Planning Commission, and I think some of them even did so. Yeah, we, we did attract a lot of, again, younger people. Yeah. You know, basically, we found that we could attract a lot of younger people. And a, an important reason for that is that the j labor market has changed from what it was when I was a, a younger person, in the sense that the labor market is full of people who do different things and they get credit for it. So these are guys who felt that if they could come to the Planning Commission for a year and a half and work on India's energy policy, yeah. uh, that would be a pretty attractive part of their CV. Absolutely, yeah. So we did get a lot of younger people. And that created its own problem because, you know, I mean, uh, in a, in a hierarchy-bound system, yeah. most of these younger people are working with people almost twice their age, uh, and they knew about three times as much. So how to integrate, <laughs> integrate them is not easy. It can be done. I mean, I'm hoping that uh, Panagria, now that he's doing the same thing, uh, I hope he sort of sticks to it and gets it done. Are there any lessons from the Singapore Civil Service, perhaps, that could be incorporated, or is that just too ideal? Or? Well, the main lesson from the Singapore Civil Service is that it's a good idea to run a country of 10 million or 5 million people. But, you know, whether you can apply that to uh, a country this size is really a problem. Sure. I mean, I think... Uh, I mean, some of the best practices, though, can be adopted. Well, but you know, the Singapore, I mean, look, the Singapore Prime Minister is, uh, I mean, this is one of the old jokes that he's one of the highest paid prime ministers in the world and one of the least wealthy. Uh, the rest yeah. of the world, somehow fellows manage to acquire a lot of money. I don't, I mean, I don't think we would be able uh, to do something similar because the resistance uh, to, look, we are, uh, I mean, a simple reform that you could do in India is to abolish all government housing, okay? Convert the housing that we are giving into a monetary equivalent and let people live wherever they like. Now, this doesn't require any legislative change. It doesn't require any constitutional change. And all said and done, uh, I mean, it's not as if civil service has that much power. And by the way, most of them would be very happy if you yeah. actually convert the monetary value sure. of their house <laughs> and say to them, look, uh, you, can, you can take this. I, I would put a very simple thing. Take a house and uh, put an attractive value on it uh, in terms of rent. And tell the person concerned that your grossed up salary after tax 
is such that you can now pay this market rent mm. and we're going to charge it to you. Which means that if you really want to live here, that's fine. Yeah. I mean, your, your gross salary goes up, you pay a little bit of tax, and the rest of it you take as rent. Or alternatively, you can move out and collect the net of tax thing yourself. I can assure you that 80% of the fellows will move out. <laughs> you know, and then, so I mean, there are lots of things that can be done with a little bit of imagination. And all these uh, housing, uh, these are hangovers from a colonial state. I mean, if you're a foreign power living in a, running a country, uh, all the civil servants are one nationality, they naturally want to live together. You know, they don't want to disperse into the native town, so to speak. Sure. But <laughs> there's no reason why that should be the case yeah. for an independent country. I'm curious about, you said you were able, you were, you could hire 60 consultants, but then you came across all these procedures which would virtually make it impossible for somebody working in the U.S. to give up their jobs and come and work. Were you able to have any success with that? Is that program still on? No, no, I, I, I think it's still on, and uh, I think they even try to improve I it. I ask this because I think there's a lot of audience here who would like to come and contribute, well, and, you know. Yeah, I tell you, I did, I did two things. I mean, one is I started a program of interns. That's just a three-month yeah. uh, thing with a fairly limited uh, salary. And we found a huge response. I mean, virtually anyone living in Delhi, in other words, staying with their parents or with their relatives, people were very keen to come and work yeah. with us. It resonated in global campuses. It, it worked extremely well, and we got very good response. Then we said, look, let's have consultants, you know, be, a, be there for a year. And um, we got some excellent responses. But these are young people. I mean, I don't think we were able to persuade anyone with a wife and kids to relocate mm. on the kind of salaries we were offering. But we were able to persuade younger people, single people, to say, okay, this is what I'm gonna do for the next year. 